All right, finally, here we go. Today, the most highly requested video. What's up, guys? I'm Brian Sakawa. You're watching He Spoke Style, and this is my watch collection. So people always ask me, you know, when did I first get into watches? And I don't really have a good answer to that. I do remember always being intrigued with watches. I, I can't really pinpoint what the fascination was. Uh, some of the earliest watches I remember having in my childhood were the Timex Ironman Triathlon, which had the start, stop, and the lap reset buttons. And I can remember having competitions with my friends to see who could push the start, stop twice the fastest. I also remember that the first watch that I sort of lusted after was this kind of neon yellow and teal swatch. And if I recall, it did have a rotating bezel. And then, of course, my first luxury watch as a child was the Gucci with the red and green dial that I bought on Canal Street. But needless to say, over the years, I've always maintained a sort of passive interest in wristwatches, but it wasn't until the last five years or so that I really got started going down the very, very deep rabbit hole of wristwatch fanaticism. Uh, and I know there are some of uh, you out there that can sympathize with that. So that brings us to my personal watch collection, which right now is about 10 watches. I'm not gonna go through them uh, in any particular order of acquisition or anything like that, so let's just get right to it. Now, the first watch here might be a little surprising to some of you. It is the Seiko 5 SNK809, $82.38 on Amazon. The Seiko 5 is universally regarded, even by serious watch nerds, as the best value in watches. You get a fantastic automatic movement for under $100, which is like, what, you know? <laughs> um, this is an easy, everyday watch to wear. I love the size at 37 millimeters. Black dial makes it very versatile. The canvas strap kind of puts it more on the casual side, but as an everyday watch, you really can't beat it. Next up is the watch that was my very first new luxury watch. This is my Rolex Datejust reference 116234. If you've seen my guide to buying your first Rolex video, you have seen this watch before and heard me talk about why I decided to buy a new watch versus a pre-owned one. I definitely recommend checking out that video if you haven't already. It took me a long time to figure out what exact Datejust I wanted. Obviously, I went with something that is extremely classic and that I feel matches my personal style very well. This is the 36 millimeter version in steel and white gold, silver dial, Jubilee bracelet, stick pin hour markers, and fluted bezel. This watch is very, very special to me. I got it to celebrate a milestone with T-Spoke style and it will always be in my collection. So not long after I got my day chest, I became obsessed with the Rolex GMT Master. First, I love the look of it with the blue and red bezel, especially the ones that had faded a little bit over time. And then finding out more about the history of the watch, which was introduced in 1954 for Pan Am Pilots, and that it really was and is a tool watch, which allows you to tell the time in two different time zones at once. So I became obsessed with this watch, and then I actually became obsessed with finding one from my birth year, which is 1977. So the watch I eventually found with the help of my friend James Lambden from Analog Shift is this one, my reference 1675 5.2 million serial number, which dates it to 1977. I love this watch. It's such a classic sports watch. Uh, I always take this with me when I travel and I use the bezel to keep track of the time back home. I like it on the bracelet a lot, though this is not actually a period correct bracelet. I also do like to swap out the bracelet for a leather or suede strap sometimes and a NATO strap in the summer. This next watch is the Cartier Drive. This is the original example from 2016, which was the first year they introduced the drive. This was a very different kind of watch for Cartier, which is one of the reasons that I liked it. Uh, with this watch, they were trying to introduce something that was more specifically aimed at the male consumer. And this watch is said to have a bit of an automotive inspiration. There's a lot of subtlety in the dial of this watch that I like, the black dial version that I have especially. Uh, there's the guilloche on the inner part of the dial and the runny sub second style. Uh, the hands almost blend in, but not. Uh, you kind of have to turn it a certain way uh, to catch the light, which just reveals more of the intricacy of the dial. And I know date windows can sort of like divide people, but I think this is a really well positioned and unobtrusive date window here. Very cool watch. All right, moving from a more contemporary Cartier design to a more classic one, this 
is my Cartier Tank American. This is the 100th anniversary version, medium size, steel case, silver dial, blue leather strap, and deployant buckle. This is a very special watch to me. This is the watch that my wife gave me on our wedding day. And on the case back, you can see inscribed our wedding date. I love the Tank American because I think it's one of those kind of under the radar watches in the Cartier Tank lineup. It's obviously extremely classic, super elegant, and just different, you know? You see Tank Solos all the time, but the Tank American is one that you don't see that often, which to me makes it even more intriguing. Next up is a heavy hitter in my collection. This is, of course, the Patek Philippe Nautilus 5711, a watch that really needs no introduction. If you're into watches at all, you know what this watch is all about, and you know how difficult it can be to come by. So I've heard that there are like waiting lists of like five to 10 years long for this watch, and as a result, it commands an absolutely absurd premium on the secondary market. So you're probably wondering how I got this, and it's actually a pretty good story. So when my wife and I bought our house a little over a year ago, just about across the street is the Patek AD. So I immediately went in there, inquired about the 5711. Of course, I was laughed at, told the list was 60 people long, people all over the world, and this and that. And I said, all right, whatever. You know, just put my name on the list. By the way, I live across the street from you. I'm local, not just some random guy who's going to take this watch from you and flip it. So I left it there. Then over the next couple months, I'd periodically check in, stop into the shop, just so he knew that I was serious. And I remember the last time I called him was on a Friday. And then the very next Monday, he called me and said, Brian, I'm going to do you a favor. I have a 5711 here, a blue dial. If you want it, it's yours. So obviously, um, in complete shock, I talked to a couple collector friends of mine, and they say, if you don't take this, you're an idiot. So uh, I had to put my money where my mouth was and I got the watch. I would consider all of the watches in my collection to be favorites, each in their own way, but there's really something uh, very, very special about the 5711. The, the design is classic, one of Genta's most famous designs next to the Royal Oak. The movement is finished exquisitely. On the wrist, it's just amazing. The slim, low profile is so elegant. I have never felt a bracelet this comfortable before. The watch itself is, is kind of unassuming, which I like, and it's also very versatile. So this is one of my everyday watches and one of my favorites in my collection. All right, moving on to what could probably be called the centerpiece of my collection, and that is this watch right here, the Alanga Unzona Datagraph. This is the original version, reference 403.035 in platinum. Every time I look at this watch or have it on my wrist, I am just in awe. So it's no secret, you know, that I am a big fan of Alanga and Zona, one of my favorite brands. There's just something about Alanga watches that, that speak to me, uh, whether it's from a design perspective, like the outsized date windows, uh, the way that dials are laid out, the amazing finish on every facet of the watch, and of course the beautiful, beautiful movements, which the Datagraph is definitely known for. Of all of the versions of the Datagraph out there, for me, the original uh, one is one of the best and mostly due to the case size because it's 39 millimeters. The up-down version with the power reserve indicator is 41 millimeters, which for me is really kind of pushing the envelope size-wise, um, especially considering the thickness of the watch. The chronograph mechanism is one of the most buttery smooth that I have ever felt before. The Datagraph has been called the most important modern chronograph, and I feel extremely fortunate to have one in my collection. I actually wear this watch all the time, and of course, if you're a watch guy, you know what this watch is, but like the 5711, this one kind of flies under the radar for a lot of people, and I like that. I like the fact that, you know, the case back notwithstanding, <laughs> that there is a sort of subtle, not totally in-your-face quality to the Datagraph. Next watch I have here uh, on my wrist actually is my IWC Ingenieur Automatic, another simple, classic, timeless, very versatile watch. Um, speaking of versatile, I did do a styling video for this watch wearing it with three different outfits, so definitely check that out if you haven't already. There are a couple things that I really love about the Ingenieur. One, again, it is sort of that under the radar watch for IWC. You know, it's not the big pilot, it's not the Portuguese line. 
Another thing is that it has in its design history a version that was created by Gerald Genta. That one was the Ingenieur SL Reference 1832 from 1976. Uh, and although the new version, which I have, more closely resembles the original from 1955, I do like that there is a little bit of Genta in this watch's DNA. Next up is the Tag Heuer Carrera Blue Dreamer, which was the first watch collaboration that Waco did with the Rake and Revolution. This was a limited edition of 100 pieces. I wanted this watch as much to support my friend as I did just because I think it's a really beautiful, beautiful piece and extremely unique. This watch was meant to evoke this sort of luxury, leisurely sportiness of the French Riviera with all the different blues on the dial. And I know that Way is also a very big fan of Kinda Blue by Miles Davis, so there's that sort of inspiration in there as well. This is my summer watch. This is the one I always have on when we go to the pool. Now one neat thing about this is I actually have number four of 100, which I requested. So on the case back, um, it says 004 slash 100. Now if you take uh, off the first and the last zero, you have my birthday, October 4th. So there is also like that little bit of personal meaning in this watch to me as well. Final watch here is another collaboration. This one was between Hodinkee and Swatch. This is the Swatch System 51 Hodinkee Vintage 84. So I got this watch mostly out of personal nostalgia for the Swatch that I had when I was in seventh or eighth grade. Um, this one is a lot more understated than the neon yellow and blue version that I had way back when, but uh, the coolest thing about this watch is actually the case back. It's an automatic movement and it just looks so cool. So that is my current watch collection. I think looking at it as a whole, that overall it really reflects my personal style and that all the watches are simple, classic, and timeless in one way or another, even though the majority of watches in my collection are modern watches. Now, as everyone who has been bitten by the watch bug or infected with the watch disease knows, there is always that next watch that you want to acquire, so I'm no different. And I thought I would share quickly some of the watches that I would love to have in my collection someday. First, which is the absolute highest on my priority list is a Langa One, one of the most beautiful and perfect modern watches in my opinion. There is no other dial like this, just so unique and interesting. And personally, I'd like to have one in rose gold with a silver dial. So next, I really think I need more gold in my collection and it doesn't get any more gold than this, the Audemars Piguet Royal Oak 152. 02BA with the gold dial also. Probably not going to be happening anytime soon unless I decide to sell my 5711, which isn't happening. So anyway, a, a guy's got a dream. Next is the Rolex Explorer 1016. As far as vintage Rolex goes, or attainable vintage Rolex, I should say, uh, it really doesn't get much better than the 1016. Back to the gold side of things, another classic, the Vacheron Constantin Traditionnel, but the boutique edition with a really interesting pattern on the dial. Um, there is an interesting Cartier that I would like to add to my collection, and that is the Monopusher Chronograph. You don't see those that often, and I just think it's a really, really cool piece. Finally, another very practical watch for me as a frequent traveler, and that is the Patek Philippe Aquanaut Travel Time 5164. So thanks for watching guys, leave your comments below, thumbs up if you like this video, don't forget to subscribe to the channel, and until next time, thanks for watching, and stay tailored.